evening. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to, the, to this first uh, Fellows reception. Uh, you're, you're all extremely welcome uh, uh, to this uh, meeting where we'll uh, celebrate the, the fellowship and hear from one of our ex-presidents, uh, Graeme Henderson, the recipient of the J.R. Vane Medal. First of all, thank you for uh, coming here and uh, also welcome to the guests that are, are with you. It's uh, important to recognize the substantial contribution that fellows make to the uh, society. As you know, uh, fellows are chosen based on their, on their contributions to the discipline of pharmacology. And uh, having shown distinction and peer recognition and in the society of 3,000 or more than 3,000 people, there are 186 fellows and 89 honorary fellows. Fellows also contribute to the work of the society and promote pharmacology and clinical pharmacology. And for that, we're, we're grateful. Uh, we look to fellows for uh, the wise heads that we need to take the society forward uh, uh, to, the next, uh, to the next level. It's also a, a chance today to celebrate the historical distinction that BPS members have achieved uh, uh, many before the, uh, the fellowship that we're celebrating tonight was, ever, was even established. That I'm proud to officially announce that the BPS members have uh, voted and chosen to elect five distinguished in individuals to honor this year. You'll have seen their pictures and uh, some comments from their family and friends uh, up on the screen. First of all, we recognize Sir James Black. Secondly, Edith Bulbring. Thirdly, Sir Henry Dale. And these are not in any order. Uh, we recognize them all as uh, people who've made a huge difference to pharmacology. Sir John Gadam is the fourth. And finally, Sir John Vane. I'd like to uh, thank particularly, and I wonder if you join me in thanking the representatives and the families of Edith Bulbring, Sir John Gadam, <laughs> Sir John Gadam, <laughs> and Sir John Vane, who are here in the audience. <laughs> the families of Sir Henry Dale and Sir James Black have sent their apologies and they've asked me to pass on their regret at not being able to join in uh, tonight's celebrations. Clearly we do uh, look uh, to and revere our uh, pharmacologists who have contributed so much to the Pharma British Pharmacological Society. One uh, who we miss uh, very much is Professor Bill Bowman. Uh, it was a privilege to attend Bill's funeral in July on behalf of the BPS. And at the funeral, there was um, significant references made not only to his contribution to pharmacology, but also to uh, our society. And uh, we really do miss uh, his input. But tonight's about the achievements that you, the fellows, have made. And uh, I'd like now just to hand over to one particular fellow who's been a member of the society since 1974. He must have been a very young member, but uh, he's now uh, a fellow. Uh, he was a fellow and made a fellow in 2011, uh, but we're also uh, privileged to have had him as our president in 2006 and 2007, and that's Professor Graham Henderson, Professor of pharmacology in the University of Bristol. I chaired the uh, judging of this year's J.R. Vane Medal, and uh, this time uh, the society decided that we would identify someone who had made enormous services to pharmacology or its teaching. And uh, it doesn't surprise any of us that uh, Graham was chosen to be that individual by the membership and awards committee. I won't discuss his CV or we'd be here forever, but he's been in great demand as a visiting professor uh, over throughout uh, the world uh, internationally. Uh, he's managed something which is very difficult in this present climate to, uh, to uh, have a successful research career as well as be a major contributor to teaching and a champion to, uh, of teaching as well as a, a great mentor to a, a generation of pharmacologists who followed in his footsteps. In his lecture on inspirations, I understand he's gonna highlight the individuals who have shaped his, uh, 
his distinguished career, and uh, and that's uh, a real tribute to uh, to what he's achieved. And so, without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Graham Henderson. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, I must say that I thought I was volunteering to give a 10-minute talk to a few people who were coming to a drinks reception. So I got a little bit of a shock when I realized I was down to, to speak for an hour. So um, maybe we'll get an early break. So it is, in fact, a great honor for me to um, be awarded the J.R. Vane Medal uh, for services to pharmacology and its teaching, uh, largely because this award is given every six years in this category. And the previous two winners have been Bill Bowman and Humphrey Rang. And so to be mentioned in the same breath as these people is a real honor for me. But we'll come back to these chaps later. Now, my wife, Julie, is a folk a music fan. And um, she likes the music of this woman, uh, Carly Simon. And Carly Simon's famous song is here. And so in our house, I'm the winner of the Ursovane Medal 2013. Julie also told me that I'm definitely not allowed to speak for an hour or she wouldn't come. Now, you may all remember John Vane as a, an avuncular chap, all right, who made very amusing speeches after dinner, read the minutes out, and they were very clever jokes. But I slightly, have a slightly different memory of him. I'm sorry, Lady Vane, that uh, I have to say he was my PhD external examiner. All right? And actually, he could nitpick with the best. Right? <laughs> and I show you here a trace from the mouse vas deference, the contractions to electrical stimulation, and the response being inhibited by phentolamine. And in my enthusiastic youthfulness, I said that the, on washout of the phentolamine, the contractions were restored to their original height. And he said, well, let's turn to page 27 then to start. He said, you realize that's only 84% of that. All right. And so I had to insert that they got back to their original height after 25 minutes, which I think puts us somewhere around here in the trace. <laughs> All right. Okay. I also have a, an, an unfortunate memory of this um, viva because he did point out that I had misspelt prostaglandins throughout. Now, I, I, I want to be a little bit self-indulgent to start with, and, and like everybody saying who'd inspired them, I want to go back to my, my school. Um, and I was a pupil at Shollins Academy in Glasgow. Uh, I downloaded this image of the school from its website now, and it says here that it's an international school. Well, I think that means they now take children from refugee families. Right? <laughs> I don't for a moment think that people come across the world to go to this inner city Glasgow school. I used to joke that I was the third most famous uh, former pupil of this school. I think now I'm relegated to sixth or seventh. The policeman in Taggart now beats me and a, and a couple of new wave um, uh, comedians. So I'm kind of waiting for somebody to say, so, so who was the second most famous person? And the second most uh, famous former pupil of this school was John Martin, who was the uh, folk musician and blues singer who unfortunately died last year, largely of excess life. <laughs> the most famous former pupil from this school is Ian Brady, the Moore's murderer. <laughs> and in the biography of um, Myra Hindley, it stated that um, Ian Brady attended this school only for a couple of months and that it was a school for the above average intelligent pupil. <laughs> but when I was at this school, I was very fortunate to come under the influence of a science teacher, Felix Lochry. And I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of him, but this cartoon sets him up because he was a young chap. It was, he must only have been out of um, college for a, a couple of years. He was a snazzy dresser. He had a, uh, a scooter and then a bubble car. And he coached the first, football the first 11 football team. And we thought he walked on water. And he made science come alive to us. He was also our form master. And one day, oh, so the, this, the, the Scottish people will realize exactly what this is. This is the toz or uh, the belt. And this is a pupil being belted. 
all right, because corporal punishment was alive and thriving in, in my day at school. And uh, one day, Felix Lochry belted our entire class. The, the reason for this was that um, what we didn't realize was that he was on his last warning from the headmaster because he was always turning up late, either because he'd slept in or because the scooter had broken down. <laughs> and so we were in the, he told us that if he was ever late, we should stand quietly in the corridor. And if you've got 30 Scottish 13-year-old schoolboys in a corridor, what do you think they're going to do? Yes, there were about three or four football matches, all right? There were a couple of fights uh, and a lot of noise. What in Scotland we would call a rammy. And so when he turned up, all right, he said, I've warned you all, and he gave us all the belt. And actually, we admired him even more for doing that because we realized we deserved it. We got our own back a couple of months later when we turned up for a chemistry class and he was out and his keys were on the desk and so we locked him out. And when he came and rattled the door, we all laughed at him. All right. <coughs> so he went into the neighboring uh, laboratory, got out a Kipps apparatus, all right, which was generating H2S. And he <laughs> pumped H2S in through the keyhole to all of us. For those of you that are not scientists, H2S means stink bombs. All right. And so he stood and laughed outside while we all stayed inside and suffered. Now, in this day and age of health and safety, all right, hydrogen sulfide is now lab labeled as an extreme health hazard and fatal or harmful if inhaled. All right. Um, Fortunately, in those days, uh, we weren't so, uh, so serious about health and safety. Right. So, when I left university, I had to choose which university I was going to go to. And being in Scotland, the obvious choice was to go to a Scottish university. And I could have followed in the footsteps of this man, Charles Darwin. Because Charles Darwin went to Edinburgh University to study medicine in 1825. Now... This is a, an extract from a letter that Darwin wrote to his sister, Caroline, in 1826. And I'll read it to you. The bits in red are for highlighting, not that Darwin put them in red. Many thanks for your very entertaining letter, which was a great relief after hearing a long and stupid lecture from Duncan on Materia Medica. As Humphrey Rang tells me, Materia Medica is clinical pharmacology, not basic pharmacology. But as you know nothing either of the lecturers, or, uh, the lecturers or lecturers, I will give you a short account of them. Dr. Duncan is so very learned that his wisdom has left no room for his sense. And he lectures, as I've already said, on the Materia Medica, which cannot be translated into any word expressive enough of its stupidity. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, if the lecturing at Edinburgh University had not been so bad, maybe we would never have had the theory of evolution. Because Darwin gave up attending the lectures and went down to the Firth of Forth uh, to, the, to the shore where Robert Grant was studying uh, uh, marine invertebrates. And he took up his interest in uh, evolution uh, from that. So I didn't go to Edinburgh University, fortunately. I went to Glasgow University all right. And this photograph is of the staff all right, in 1971, the year that I graduated. And you can see here John Gillespie, who was the uh, head of department. And some of you may recognize this chap. This is a young Ian McGrath, the uh, editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Pharmacology now. Uh, the hair is a bit grayer, but it's still about the same length. <laughs> now, there are a couple of people in this photograph who bear the responsibility for my continuing dislike of receptor theory and microantibiotics, all right? Because they were taught in a style that Darwin would have uh, appreciated, all right? But I'm not going to name names. I want to highlight these two chaps here, all right? This is Asa Blakely, and this is Roger Summers. <coughs> Asa Blakely eventually went on to be professor of physiology at Leicester. Uh, un unfortunately, he died quite young. And Roger Summers is uh, at the University of Monash now in Australia, and I visited him a few months ago um, to realize that he still looks exactly the same as he does in this photograph. Now, I undertook my final year research project under their supervision. And on the first day, I turned up and this, they said, well, you better build your apparatus. I said, well, so what should I do? He said, well, you'll need a heavy steel plate. 
And so the first thing I did was have to go and get a classmate who had a car. And we went to the steel mill, and we bought a big piece of steel plate. And I had to come back and get somebody to cut it up and bore holes in it. And I had to build my own apparatus and then do my experiments. It was a great learning experience for me. This year in Bristol, we have a student who has appealed the quality of the degree that she was awarded because she didn't get any results in the first week of a research project. I don't think that, that student would have uh, survived with, with Asa and, and Roger. But the other thing that uh, Asa and Roger did was they encouraged me to submit an abstract to the BPS summer meeting uh, in Oxford in 1971. Uh, and here it is here, and a couple of interesting things about this. The first is you'll notice that they made it a single author, a publication. And, and what I don't know is whether or not uh, that was out of kindness or whether or not they were protecting their scientific reputations. Anyway, I looked this up on Web of Knowledge this morning, and I'm proud to say it has been cited once. <laughs> anyway, we came down, and oh, sorry, before we came down, I was, um, I, I was rehearsed. I was rehearsed over and over again. And at the end of the rehearsals, John Gillespie, who to me was a very tall man who leant right over me, he leant over me and said, boy, be proud of your accent. And I looked at him somewhat mystified because I'd never left Glasgow by this time and I thought everybody spoke the way that I did. <laughs> anyway, I came down um, with uh, Roger and Asa and we stayed at, at New College and um, we went to, to the meeting. And these were the days when the society had a single session. And in the lecture theatre, the, it was packed. The front few rows were filled with the great and the good. I think John Vane was the meeting secretary at the time, and, and a whole host of, 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 uh, of people were, were there. And I got through my talk, and I blurted out an answer to a question and, and, and got down. And, and there was a vote, and the abstract was accepted. And I sat down, right, completely relieved that it was, uh, it was all over. And the next talk passed in a kind of blur of adrenaline. But at the end of the next talk, an elderly gentleman, sorry, this affects me every time, an elderly gentleman got up from the front row. He walked up the stairs, and as he passed me, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, that was a very good talk. And you know, even today, I get emotional about that. And that's what I think is about inspiration. I mean, he didn't need to say it. He could have just gone to the toilet quickly, as he probably wanted to. But he took a, a few moments. For many years, I thought it must have been uh, Felberg. All right? But actually, with hindsight, because uh, the abstract was on Monet in Oxidase, it was probably Herman Blaschko. After graduating from uh, Glasgow University, I went uh, to the University of Aberdeen, to the Unit for Research on Addictive Drugs, to work with John Hughes and Hans Kostelitz. And there were some other people there at the time. There was Alan North, Sandy McKnight, and, and Alistair Corbett. And we worked here in Marshall College. Uh, this is the, the room where John Hughes isolated the Enkephalins. And I've uh, nominated this as one of the places to go on the BPS's pharmacology map, because I think it's a very memorable uh, place in British pharmacology. Now, to work with Hans Kostelitz was just a, an incredible experience. I could go on all night telling you stories about all the great things that he did. And in fact, when the people in the previous photograph meet, that's exactly what we do. We just go on and on about, uh, do you remember this? Do you remember that? But I've just picked out a few things uh, to, to tell you about tonight. First of all, he taught me scientific rigor. Very early on, I was doing some experiments and I was getting um, res responses that were completely variable. And, 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 it, and he said, well, are you using different Hamilton syringes? And I said, yes. He said, well, have you calibrated them? And I said, calibrate them? No, it says three microliters on the side. And he just looked absolutely appalled that I hadn't taken time at the start uh, to, to calibrate my syringes. He had great enthusiasm for science. Uh, late in his life, I, I visited Aberdeen, and I took he and uh, Hannah Kostelitz out for lunch. And I said, oh, I'm going to Geneva to the Glaxo Molecular Biology Laboratories to learn some molecular biology. And he said, oh, you know, Graham, that's what I need to do. I need to get more molecular biology into my group. 
Uh, the man was about 86 and could hardly count by this time, but he still wanted to be designing experiments. He had an amazing ability to see the best in other people. I mean, for a man who liked John Hughes, Alan North, and Graham Henderson, you must realize that he had a great ability to see something in everyone. He also had great generosity to his young colleagues, and uh, uh, he was very good to me. He used to take me to lunch with, the, with the, a lot of professors, and as they were chatting, he would always turn and say, we need a young person's view, Graham, and I would blurt something out. And if it was sensible, he would take it on and embellish it. And if it was nonsense, he'd tell me right away it was nonsense. But I, this is, uh, this, uh, this was, uh, to me, this was a great man. After a brief sojourn in Chicago, I came back uh, to the University of Cambridge uh, to work in Alan Cuthbert's department. Now, Alan Cuthbert offered me a lectureship in Cambridge uh, without ever having met me or without having interviewed me. Um, I think he was under great pressure to make an appointment or lose it. And so he took some uh, references from people who knew me and, and then made an offer to me. So when I turned up on the 1st of April, 1980, I think he may have thought that it was really was an April Fool's joke. I learned a lot of lessons from Alan, but, but one of them was never put your head above the parapet unnecessarily. Because um, at an early staff meeting, we were discussing the curriculum, and I said, so, so why are there no demonstrations of a superfusion apparatus to measure prostaglandins? And without drawing breath, he said, yes, I think it's a great idea, Graham, you can do it. And so, for the next 10 years, I uh, was, was put on a demonstration for medical students in, uh, in Cambridge, showing the release of prostaglandins uh, from the rat spleen. Well, that's what the students thought I was doing. But I learned very quickly that it's impossible. Well, it was impossible for me, all right? And so, what I would do is, while saying that we were just about to stimulate the spleen or whatever, I'd walk to the other side of the room while the technician would inject through one of these a mixture of prostaglandins. And lo and behold, the assay tissues would give us exactly the right answer. And this taught me a great lesson. Students don't need to see the truth. They just need to be convinced of what you're telling them. As well as being a lecturer at the University of Cambridge, I was uh, awarded a fellowship of Sydney Sussex College. Now, I think if I'd asked you all to name a Cambridge college, we'd probably have to go around the room three or four times, and then I would have to have said, what about Sydney Sussex College? It's not one that comes to mind straight away. It's a small college, and it's a great college. It's very inwardly looking. It's very good to its students, and it's very good to its fellows. Now, this chap here, Oliver Cromwell, was an undergraduate at Sydney Sussex College. Um, and when he died, he was buried in Westminster, interred in Westminster Abbey. But when Charles II came to power, he, Cromwell's body was disinterred. It was hung in Tyburn for a, for a day. And then the head was taken, all right, and it was put on a, a, a stake and, and, and placed outside uh, Westminster Hall. I'm not sure how long later, but there was a great storm and it fell down. And his supporters, who were kind of hiding around, gathered it up and ran away with it. And um, from, from then on, uh, the skull was kept by various families, exhibited in some museums. But in 1960, uh, the head was given uh, to um, Sydney Sussex College. And so in the vestibule of the college chapel, uh, it says, Near to this place was buried on the 25th of March, the head of Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland, fellow commoner of this college. And the story is that only two fellows, the master and one other, know exactly where it's buried so that uh, people can't come and, and steal it. All right? Personally, I don't believe it's buried there at all. I think it's in a tin can up in the master's lodge. All right? But uh, that's where it's supposed to be. <coughs> now... I had a great time in, in Sydney Sussex College, and, and this is the, the dining hall. And uh, when I arrived, I was told that I was expected to dine with the other fellows on a Friday evening at the high table here while the students would dine there. As a young person, I thought there was a bit of an imposition in my social life to have to go into college on a Friday night. But I realized quite quickly that the quality and quantity of the wines 
determined the night of the week in which we actually met. But the, 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 the very nice thing about this is that I was the only pharmacologist in college. I was one of only three medical scientists in college. The other people were lawyers, historian, linguists, and so on. And we actually discussed the university over dinner rather than the kind of nitty-gritty day-by-day silly things that get on everybody's nerves but, and have become so important to us. Right? And it was a very nice experience to dine uh, on a Friday evening with the fellows. The other very nice thing is that the college invited the retired fellows to dine on a Friday evening with the current fellows. And some of these old duffers that came in on sticks and shaking had very, very great wisdom. I'm going to tell you two stories about it. One is of a guy called John Thornley, who, when he heard I was going to leave Cambridge and go to Bristol, he goes, oh, I have very fond memories of Bristol, Graham. He said, I remember the day in 1939, my chum and I, he said, we walked down to Bristol from, from uh, Gloucester, he said, and we signed up to go to war. He said, I, I then went and found a phone, and I called my tutor in Cambridge and said, sorry, I can't come back for second year. I'm off to the war. The other person I want to tell you about is Sir Austin Robinson. Sir Austin Robinson was a, an economist at the time of Keynes. Right? Many people say that he was cleverer than Keynes, right? but that he, didn't, he wasn't as much of a self-publicist. Um, and one night over dinner here, um, the, the conversation got round to sport, and it came out that, that I was a keen uh, hockey player. And Sir Austin kind of looked at me and said, Ah, oh, you play hockey, do you, Graham? I said, yes. He said, um, do you play for college? He said, when I was your age, I played for college. He said, uh, do you play for the college team? So I sort of puffed my chest out. I said, well, actually, no. I, you know, the college team plays during the week and the afternoons, and, and I'm a scientist. You know? I, I have to run a laboratory. And so he looked at me with a wry smile, and he said, you chaps today work much harder than we did in my day. There was like pause, then he said, but I don't think you achieve nearly as much. And I think he probably is quite right. And when I was making this talk up, uh, this document came uh, emailed to me because in Bristol at the moment, my department's going through a safety audit. And I got this to fill out about whether or not my computer screen, my keyboard, my mouse, my software, the seat I sat on, or even the environment were safe. All right. Now, I don't think Sir Austin Robinson ever filled out a form like this. But he should have, because he used to use a fountain pen. And you know, you can poke your eye out with a fountain pen. <laughs> the uh, keen uh, science historians amongst you will have logged into this photograph here right away. Right? Because this photograph is of Charles Wilson. All right? And Charles Wilson got the Nobel Prize for inventing the cloud chamber uh, which, with which you could observe ionizing radiation. And that's, that's him there. And, and of course, he was a Scotsman. But the interesting thing is that he maintained that he was inspired to develop the cloud chamber by sightings of a Brock inspector while on the summit of Ben Nevis. Not, all right, stuck behind a desk filling out forms, but out on the top of Ben Nevis. And for those of you who don't know what a Brock Inspector is, this is a Brock Inspector. It's a phenomenon where there, in the mountains there may be cloud lower than you, and the sun is shining from your back, and, and you get a, a shadow on the, on the clouds in, in the distance. And as you walk up like this, this can be quite eerie because it actually looks like somebody's walking towards you out of the cloud. All right? And that's a Brock Inspector. So I now just want to ask a question, which is, can jealousy actually inspire? And I, obviously, my answer is going to be yes. So, this is the guy I'm jealous of, Robin Plevin, who's the professor of, Strath uh, of pharmacology at Strathclyde. And obviously, right away, you will realize that I'm not jealous of his good looks or of his hairline, right? What I'm jealous of appears, uh, should appear, he appears here in a cutting from the Glasgow Herald in 1983. And because as well as being an outstanding scientist, Robbie Plevin was one of the most talented young hockey players uh, that uh, Scotland had in the early 80s. And he played hockey for Scotland. He played hockey for Scotland many times. 
Now, I'm a keen hockey player. All I ever managed to be was a, a reasonable club player. But eventually, all right, I managed to get there. Because a couple of years ago, I was asked to tour with the West of England over 60s hockey team. And, and we went to, to Wales to a, a tournament. And the Scottish Thistles, the Scottish over 60s international team, had come down too. And on the Saturday, uh, two of their players got injured. And so they were one short for their match on the Sunday. And hearing that I was Scottish, they asked me if I would uh, play for them. And so I can proudly announce tonight that the British Pharmacological Society has two, as it fellows, uh, has two fellows who are Scottish international hockey players. <laughs> but on a slightly more serious note, though, it got me to think that there must be many people in our society who are very good at something else, but we don't know about it. Right? Um, and it may be that um, the pharmacology matters should start to highlight these and maybe think of, 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 of uh, getting a few articles about them. I mean, for example, I know that Rod Flower is an accomplished magician. That's magician, by the way, not musician. Right? I also know that Helen Cox was an international swimmer. She also, not very many people know this next fact, she also at one time was aspiring to be Britain's first astronaut. But I'm sure there are many others and it would be good to know what everybody in the society is good at other than science. Now the next person I want to talk about is Sir James Black. <laughs> For the 75th anniversary we were developing a brochure that was going to be sent out to all members and we had the idea that we would have a photograph in it of, of the greats of the society. And we had the one of John Vane and the chymograph that I showed at the start. And, but all we had of Sir James were very official photographs. And so I wrote to him and asked him if he could send me a photograph. And he sent me this photograph, all right, which is of himself and R.C. Gary. Now, R.C. Gary um, was the professor of physiology at Glasgow. And I was the first person to give Sir James Black a job. And, and so, so Sir James Black um, thought that, uh, or, 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 so Gary was James, Gluck's, uh, James Black's mentor. Uh, and actually, um, Sir so James was a graduate of uh, St. Andrews University. I thought I'd show you something different than a picture of a university. So this is the 18th hole at St. Andrews, for those of you that don't play golf. And Many years later, he was elected rector. Now, Scottish universities have this position as rector. The students get to elect someone who represents them on court. All right? And so the students elected uh, Sir James Black. And as the uh, rector of St. Andrews, all right, he was allowed to give two honorary degrees. All right? um, and so he chose to give one uh, to R.C. Gary. And this is the photograph from the graduation ceremony. So when this arrived, all right, I... I I looked at it and I, I was quite touched. And um, I emailed uh, Sir James and said um, that I too had known Gary because Gary had, was in his last year as a professor of physiology when, when I was studying physiology as part of my degree at Glasgow. And I wrote that um, I had a fond memory of, of, uh, of Gary because I had a viva. It wasn't, it wasn't a pass-fail viva. It was a, uh, <laughs> we were all vivid. Um, I had a viva uh, with the external examiner and Gary. And Gary had, had what, what Gary would do is if the external examiner was sitting here facing the student, Gary would sit to his right and a little bit further back so that the external examiner couldn't see Gary. And as you gave your answers, you got immediate feedback on the quality of your answer from the face of Gary. And I wrote to Sir James and said, I well remember the question was, how do local anesthetics work? And I blurted out, they block calcium channels. And horrendous look on Gary's face. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't mean calcium channels. I mean it's some other type of channel. And then suddenly blurted out again, oh, yes, sodium channels. And so I got an email back from Sir James. And all it said on it was, bless you, Graham, James. Now, I was very pleased to receive this email, but also slightly disappointed. Can you imagine 
Right? Well, this is the day of email, and it just comes at you, and it comes up in whatever script you've got on your computer. Can you imagine if he'd written this on a headed piece of notepaper and signed it? I would have immediately have had it framed above my desk for the rest of my life. But unfortunately, it was an email, and it's been erased. Now, I want to, uh, to turn to, to Bill Bowman, who uh, Phil uh, mentioned uh, sadly died a, a few years ago. But before we turn to this, I, I want to tell you that in Bristol nowadays, we have peer reviewing of teaching. So each member of staff has to listen to some other member of staff's uh, teaching and, and give a critique of it. And so a few years ago, a young lecturer, newly appointed, was given the job of uh, peer reviewing one of my lectures. So I went in and uh, I, I gave her what I thought was a brilliant lecture. And I was just standing at the end, basking in the, 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 the afterglow of my own eloquence. When this young chap came up and said, you didn't, answer, uh, you didn't ask the students any questions. I went, pardon? He said, you didn't ask the students any questions. You didn't engage them. So I looked at him and I said, were you ever a student? He said, yes. I said, well, when you sat in a lecture, did you want to be asked questions? I said, didn't you turn up for lectures in the morning, sometimes having been out too late at night, maybe having drunk too much? Or maybe you were sitting in the lecture trying to work out how you could get to chat to that young girl in the front and ask her out? I said, in my day, the last thing we would have wanted was to have been asked questions by the lecturer. <coughs> but apparently students today are entirely different. Apparently students, uh, there's one of my students in the, in, in the middle there, I'm tempted to ask him if it's true. Uh, apparently students now, they all turn up at lectures going, I hope he asks us questions. <laughs> and yes, you've got it. I'm going to ask you questions because this is the modern way. So this is actually a little competition. All right. Um, here are four photographs, or, or four illustrations. Uh, they all, or each has a, a connection to, to Bill Bowman. All right. And I, I wonder if anyone can uh, think of the connections of these um, to, to Bill. I see Ian McFadgen there. I think Ian McFadgen should maybe get that one. Phil Routledge should get that one too, I think. Uh, no? I'll make it a little bit easier. I'll tell you what they are. This is the first color photograph ever taken. This is Ben Venue, a Scottish mountain. This is Rough Island from Rockcliffe. And this is a wheelbarrow. <laughs> Can anyone give me a connection of, or think, or even hypothesize, think out of the box? Because even, I should have said that in, in, in Bristol, I, I, I now do this with the students. I always ask them questions. And, and I always say, and by the way, boys, don't wear an English rugby shirt to my lecture tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Rod. Yeah, uh, well, he took this photograph. He took that photograph. That's good. Anything else? Ian McFadgen, are you in? Can you hazard a guess? Southwest Scotland. Southwest Scotland, Rough Island from Rockcliffe. Bill had a house uh, in Rockcliffe. All right, well, I'm now going to go through each of these and, and talk about them. So I first want to talk about the first color photograph ever taken. So the first color photograph was taken by James Clark Maxwell. Many of you will know Maxwell better for his work on electromagnetism. Indeed, Einstein said of James Clark Maxwell that the work of James Clark Maxwell changed the world forever. <coughs> now, our Queen and Einstein actually differ. Because in 1960, when celebrating the tercentenary of the Royal Society, the Queen made a speech in which she named the greats of the Royal Society. And all of Scotland groaned when she didn't include the name of James Clark Maxwell. That was a joke, by the way, because almost nobody in Scotland knows who James Clark Maxwell is. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Now, <laughs> Maxwell and I have some things in common and one very uh, important thing that we don't have in common. He was, at one time, the professor of natural philosophy or physics at uh, Marshall College in the University of Aberdeen. All right. So he was Scottish. We both worked at Marshall College. 
But the thing that we have that, that differs all right, between us is that when I left Marshall College all right, to go to work in the United States, I resigned. James Clark Maxwell was made redundant by Marshall College. All right? He was made redundant by Marshall College even although he'd married the principal's daughter. And what it was is that Marshall College was combining with uh, King's College to form the University of Aberdeen. And the professor of physics at the University of Aberdeen uh, was a friend of the, the person who was going to be the head of the, of the new university. And so he got the job and, and James Clark Maxwell didn't. He got made a fellow of the Royal Society the following year, which tells you something about the judgment of the people in Aberdeen uh, University. <coughs> now, the thing that, uh, uh, that uh, brings uh, James Clark Maxwell and uh, <coughs> Bill Bowman together is that uh, they both uh, had houses in uh, the Dumfries and Galloway area of Scotland. Uh, Bill Bowman um, had a, for a long time a summer house in Rockcliffe while he was still at Strathclyde. Uh, and latterly, uh, he and his wife moved to Rockcliffe permanently. And here you can see the sun setting over a rough island uh, off Rockcliffe. And in the announcement of his death, all right, his daughter wrote that he had come back to Rockcliffe uh, towards the end of his life. And on the night that he died, there had been a wonderful sunset over rough island. James Clark Maxwell was uh, the, the, the son of a, a family who, who owned this estate, so eventually he inherited this. And he would come back here for very long periods of, of, of the year, maybe it's up to six months. Oh, sorry, I should have said, after Aberdeen, he went to King's College, and then he went to Cambridge. So he didn't do too badly, having been made redundant by Aberdeen. Um, and, and he says in his, uh, in his writings that some of his most inspirational thoughts came when he was riding around this estate going to see his tenant farmers. And that actually you need time to think uh, rather than just uh, time to be doing things. This photograph here of Ben Venu right, is, a, is, is a, a, a printed photograph of, of, of a, a picture that Bill had taken himself. And uh, the relevance of this is that uh, when I became the vice president meetings, all right, the people that edited the BPS bulletin, which then went on to be PA2 and now Pharmacology Matters, uh, they had the great idea that Arthur Weston, who had just become treasurer and myself, we should write a day in the life. And Arthur wrote one. It was a, a very interesting article, but it set out just what he did during the day, all right, getting up at 4 a.m. and dealing with emails and so on. All right. So I had the idea that I would try and write something that was humorous, which was a great idea until I came to start to write it, actually. Right? And I was just sort of riven with doubts because I thought, well, you know, I don't know if anybody will find this funny. You know? So when it was near completion, I sent it to uh, two friends in Scotland, the McKnight and Corbett, who'd uh, appeared uh, earlier on the photograph. And, and back it came with, ah, it's all right. Right? which in Scotland is, is great praise, I suppose, but at the time it wasn't quite what I was wanting. All right? So this article appeared, and then a postcard uh, appeared in my uh, mailbox, and it was from Bill. He'd basically taken the photograph, drawn an ink line down it, put my uh, address on it, and on the other side had simply written, A Day in the Life, Loved It, Bill Bowman. And it was then that I realized that actually, if, I, if Bill liked it, then it was okay. The Scots in you will have realized that I don't think the choice of stamp by Bill was an accident at all. Now, the wheelbarrow um, is related or connected to Bill from his time as General Secretary of IUFAR from 1994 to 1998. Now, IUFAR is an organization that oversees pharmacology throughout the world, but it's an organization which has absolutely no money. It has no journals. It has almost no income. Its income comes from subscriptions, all right? And the, the BPS is the only organization that ever pays its subscription on time. I, you far, love the British Pharmacological Society. <coughs> so Bill told me the story once of, of when he was general secretary that um, they decided to have a, a newsletter before email and so on, Pharmacology International. And so one weekend, he and Anne down at Rockcliffe had spent the weekend 
putting Pharmacology International copies into envelopes and sticking them down, all right? And the wheelbarrow comes from, on the Monday morning, they loaded all these envelopes into a wheelbarrow and took them down to the post office in Rockcliffe to post them off. So it was, um, it was Bill who taught me the value of IUFAR in, in developing pharmacology in the developing world. Um, and so now I'm the vice president of IUFAR, and it's largely uh, due to Bill's influence that I was interested in taking that job on. Now, when I was president of the British Pharmacological Society, I think one of my major achievements was to persuade uh, the society to give IUFAR um, a significant sum of money to help develop the IUFAR database of receptors and ion channels. And I'm very pleased to say that my uh, successors have gone on to give them even more or larger sums of money. And we've now got a, an IUFAR BPS collaboration, which has, has given rise to the Guide to Pharmacology. And if there's anyone in here who hasn't looked at that yet, then uh, you're seriously missing out. I couldn't mention IUFAR without mentioning the World Congress in 2014, uh, to hope that you're all going to attend uh, the Congress. And to uh, highlight that our own uh, BPS Young Pharmacologists Committee have been fundraising to support uh, Africa, young African scientists to go to the meeting. Uh, there's no easy jet across Africa. It's full fare or nothing. And so for a young scientist to get from Nigeria or Ghana or uh, Algeria uh, to the meeting, it's going to cost them a lot of money. And the young pharmacologists have been selling these t-shirts, all right, and, and uh, I bought a whole host of these. I think I bought more of these t-shirts than anybody else. And I got this photograph taken of the IUFAR exec. But being Scottish, all right, I didn't let it rest there. I told them all that they had to pay me $20 for the t-shirt. Um, they only cost me five pounds each, so I made a bit of a profit. So, <coughs> moving towards the end of the talk, all right, I, uh, I wanted to mention uh, these gentlemen here. All right, um, About five years ago, I got an email on a Friday afternoon from Humphrey Rang. And in typical Humphrey style, it said, Dear Graham, you know this book that I've been producing over the years? Well, it's got to be a bit of a drag, you know? We have to revise it all the time. Do you think you could maybe see your way to writing a few chapters with us? So what he didn't realize is that I would have cut my left arm off to be associated with this book because it is so famous. All right. So <coughs> I was then invited to be a, a co-author on the seventh edition. And Maureen Dale has, has faded uh, as she, uh, uh, into retirement now, uh, but we have editorial meetings where uh, we meet Humphrey, Jim, and, and Rod, and, and you will realize, if you know these people, that they're absolute gentlemen, right? So we meet, and, and you put forward ideas. Nobody ever says your idea is bad, all right? You just, your idea is just never mentioned again, <laughs> all right? Okay. And in fact, we all go away, and then Humphrey tells us what to do, because it's Humphrey's book anyway. Right? But when I was in Cambridge, Brian Callingham described me as the broken bottle Scott who always went for the jugular. So it has, in fact, for me, been a great pleasure to uh, be associated with these people and, and to see that there are different ways of, of telling people uh, that, that you don't like their idea, right, rather than just saying it's crap. So to finish, I just wanted to ask the question of what does being a BPS fellow actually mean? So the first thing is, it's an accolade, all right? It says here that you've been elected to the fellowship of the society in recognition of your distinguished service to pharmacology and the society. The second thing is that it's an expense because your membership subscription almost doubles overnight if you accept being a fellow. Rod Flower, I think it was, who initiated the fellowship scheme, all right? And I think that was his main aim, was to increase the income. But I'd like to just finish by saying that I think being a B BPS fellow also means that you've got an obligation to inspire. And when you're going through the winter meeting and you think, shall I go to that session or shall I go off and buy my partner's Christmas presents, all right? You really should go in there and sit and listen to the young pharmacologists. And maybe like Herman Blaschko, you can put your hand on somebody's shoulder. 
Or maybe as you walk along the, across the poster session to the wine and your friends, and there's a young scientist standing there at his poster on his own with nobody that's spoken to him. You could just give a couple of minutes and go and say, uh, what's all this stuff you've got here, and show some interest. I think what I've been trying to get at tonight is that some of the things that have inspired me have been kindnesses by great people, all right, which have had a great influence on me. And I actually don't think they even noticed they were doing it because that's the sort of thing that they did every day because they were that sort of person. Thank you very much. <laughs>